Well, it's a warm welcome to James Martin, who is head of the Department for Economic Development at Ngongluvu District. James, we spoke in July last year, just after the KZN riots. At the time, you uh, gave us some useful insights into the role, very positive role, that the taxi owners had played in quelling the riots, or at least uh, making sure that the disaster wasn't even greater. Has there been any positive consequence uh, thereafter? Hmm. Well, whew. it's nice to speak to you again, Alec, under um, somewhat more less, less turbulent conditions. Last time we spoke, uh, we hadn't slept and we'd all lost a couple of kgs. Um, it's a, the, the positive consequences, I think, is our community have, have, have come together. Um, that, that was a pretty intense event in the suburbs we've come together. And I think as a business community, it's solidified the, the unity amongst us. Uh, I also think on the positive side, the communities that were participating in the looting realized that it probably wasn't the wisest uh, three days of their lives, despite the, the short rewards that they did obtain from the, the looting and the shivers regals that they enjoyed. But I think every family in the Edendale Valley lost, a, fa a family member of every family sort of lost a job or lost an income. And I think they're still picking up the pieces of that. So, yeah, it's, I think we're back on track, but uh, it's been a, it's been a slow it's been a slow climb out of out of the the valley of looting. Well, we know the economy generally in South Africa is nowhere near where it was pre-COVID, and you'd think that as a consequence of the looting and the riots in KZN, in the the local economy, the provincial economy, would take a while to recover or get back to where it was pre the looting. Are we there yet? Mm. Some of the sectors are actually. Um, tourism is back to where it was, and we're grateful for the fact that it's there's been a shift in the in the tourists. So it's local tourists now. Uh, the bed numbers are sort of up to where they were pre COVID. And now we're waiting for the for the foreigners to arrive, which should have then in, in, tip the numbers over the COVID and you know the pre-COVID level. Agriculture has always been doing well, uh, obviously with the good rains that we're having, and people need to eat. Um, so that that's that's survived well. And interesting things like the the um, hardware stores where people are building informally a lot. There's so much informal building taking place. So those kind of retail guys are are showing really strong strong results um, in the retail side. The guys that are taking strain, obviously it's the load shedding and the various other consequences are, are, are really battling to survive. But uh, yeah, we, we're almost back, I would say, to pre-COVID days. There's still a couple of shops in town that, are, that haven't recovered and they're still empty and uh, you know people had to reinvent themselves. But I think on the whole, we, we're on track uh, as, a, as a business community back to where we should be. And by town, you mean the city of Peter Maritzburg? Mm, city of Maritzburg and the, the outlying towns. Some of them were family businesses that just couldn't come back. You know, the big guys have all come back. The insurance is paid out. The small guys are hustling like they were hustling before. But it's the moms and dads who had bonded their house, who who, who weren't insured, uh, for whom it was, I think, just too much to try and get to get back on the ship. Others have built up very slowly. But for some, uh, it's just it's been closed shop and get out of town. Yeah. Sure. Well, let's hope that the lessons have been learned. The penny has dropped. Uh, it's it's a real learning curve that we in South Africa are going through on so many fronts, uh, not least load shedding. Uh, I where I'm am at the moment, we've had ten and a half hours of load shedding a day at the moment, uh, and it it really is difficult to run a business or to engage um, without having. Uh, power supply. We hear today, the 14th of December, that Andre de Reiter, the chief executive of Eskom, has thrown in the towel. He's resigned. All kinds of reasons why, uh, that he, he couldn't take the pressure anymore. But it does appear as though in many parts of South Africa, people are now saying, look, we can't rely on a central supplier of electricity uh, anymore. We've got to make a plan. We've got to do something different. What are you guys doing in your district? Okay, well, maybe just to set the scene, I mean, and, and I don't want to labor the issue, the consequences it, from the agricultural sector to from our dairy farmers to 
the the local bakeries, um, everybody, every single business is affected by load shedding, however you look at it. Um, so maybe just to, to contextualize, I'm with the Economic Development Agency in Mgungundlovu. After the rioting, we set up, just uh, after we spoke last, we set up a unit called Economic Recovery. And the idea of that is it's, it's an economic ripcord to try and fast track um, anything that's going to get the economy back on track and to get the jobs back to keep our investors and to attract new investors. And I head up the economic economic recovery side of that. So I carry with me a mandate of government um, as the agency. Now, if I could just explain, um, the district municipality, in this case, in Google Global, is a water supplier. That's its mandate. District municipalities can provide water, um, bulk infrastructure, things like um, fire engines and, and wastewater, et cetera. So that's our function. The municipality then through a council resolution mandated that the agency for which I'm working, which is completely owned by um, the district municipality as a state-owned enterprise, be tasked at looking at creative energy solutions, whether it's the wheeling or the generation of energy. So my discussion with you today is as much around Eskom and energy as it is around the economy. Our, our biggest threat to job loss in this district is energy right now. It's without a doubt at the top of everybody's mind. It's on the lips of all our big businesses who are taking real strain. And maybe just to add that in this district of a million people, um, one third of, the, fam one third of the, the people don't have three meals a day. 60% of our population is under the age of 24 and 64% of them of working age are unemployed. So we're sitting in a in a precarious socioeconomic situation. It's not business as usual. And I think that's the message that we've taken to whoever we've spoken to about what I'm about to tell you um, in terms of what the way we, we see this going forward. Maybe also just to say that Melanie and the Chamber are on board. Our colleagues from NAFCOC are on board. I have spoken to Eskom, various role players. So we're not speaking in a vacuum here and we have the blessing of our political leadership um, to be driving what we're driving right now. So if we were to look at, at load shedding and the consequences thereof from an economic perspective, which is where my area of responsibility lies, it's on the jobs, it's on the investors, it's on the business community, and we're feeling their pain. We're feeling the fact that they stand up and they say they're wanting to disinvest. We, we are on the brink of um, launching a new city at Camperdown, 400 hectares. We have major investors potentially coming into that whole new Midrand, if I can call it that, between Maritzburg and Durban. That is potentially the province's biggest growth area. And we feel we can't attract them without um, offering them at least reliable energy supply. So we're taking out the sniper rifle and we're focusing energy on the business community because you and I, we can do without a bath um, for a day or two. We can put the gas heater Come on, just admit it. <laughs> well, the British have taught us that. <laughs> Weeks on end. Um, <laughs> we can put the gas cooker on and we can make our coffee in the morning. And, and so domestically, uh, it's not that we don't care, but that really is not our focus right now. Our intention, and we put out a call for independent power producers uh, two months back. That closed at the end of November. We've had submissions now from, excuse me, solar hydropower, um, gas, biodigesters, so and wind. We've got a, a really nice mix of RPPs who are willing to come in. We went one beyond that, and we said we would assist you as the agency in finding land. We would assist you in finding funding, and we will assist you um, in any of the NURSA applications so that our job at the agency, part of, uh, of it is the, the reduction in red tape uh, for our business community and our investors, and the same would apply to the RPPs. Having said that, it closed on the fifth on, on the end of this, of November, and we now have um, an undisclosed number of who we think really solid contesters. And having spoken to Eskom and to to the various business community, our approach is going to be, for now specifically, given the urgency of the situation, if we can uh, generate through the biodigesters in Amgeni municipality to tap in to the big businesses in Amgeni municipality or the municipality itself and have a direct relationship with them. Unfortunately, if a municipality is not in good standing with ESCOM, it's going to be difficult to, to um, work through 
the credit lines, et cetera, that exist that are, are intricately tied in with the ESKIM uh, accounts department. Having said that, we will be identifying. So, for example, in Peter Maritzburg, there are areas like Kersisla, Mkondeni, four or five key areas, which are our job nodes, um, five, 10,000 jobs in each of those nodes. We intend putting a large battery pack at the entry point, the electrical entry point to that node. We will then use through our IPPs, the, whether it's solar, whether it's gas, whether it's wind, hydro, biogas, um, we, will re we will then charge battery packs in that business community's entry point so that when load shedding kicks in, it will automatically kick on instead of a generator, a battery pack for that business community. It's a stop and go. It doesn't affect Eskim's overall delivery. It's almost as if we had a generator in the parked in the corner. Instead, we've got a battery. So we're replacing diesel in the form of generators with solar, whatever the case might be. If we can do it within a local municipality, then we avoid the wheeling charges. It's an internal network matter, and it's plug and play. Um, so obviously, in the case of Msunduzi, we would want to find as many uh, energy sources that we could within the municipality. In the case of Mgeni, it would be the same in the case of, of Moy River. So in each of those municipalities, we have um, pretty good natural resources in the form of solar. Wind, not so much. We've got vultures, we've got bats, so the big uh, wind turbines are not really appropriate. Um, but certainly on the solar side, we're looking at Springgrove Dam for hydro. There's another two other dam projects we're looking at for hydro. Um, so it's a mix of those. About five years ago, we did a feasibility study into the possibility of biogas from our agricultural sector. Chicken manure in the Lions River area, for example, um, the, the pig farms in the Camberg. We've got those statistics, and we're hoping now that we'll be able to um, plug in through those RPPs. It's going to be a partnership with all, all five of them. Yeah, I've said it. Uh, a partnership with all five of them, uh, collectively then firing up battery packs um, in strategic points in and around those industrial nodes so that it's amazing stuff james it's amazing stuff you, you, you what you're saying then if i understand correctly is that you'll have you have these industrial nodes you'll you'll be putting in battery packs they must be seriously large battery packs and then you do deals with independent power producers to make sure those battery packs are charged so when eskim goes off that the businesses have actually got power. Continue. It doesn't affect Eskim's grid. It doesn't affect their bottom line. We might as well be a diesel generator parking in the corner. Um, That's that. That sounds obvious now that you've dis you've discussed it. But how long is it going to take to put everything together? My guys are saying within a year we could be operational, which is what we're aiming for. So obviously it's Christmas, which is giving us. A six-week breather, unfortunately, but uh, in the middle of January, we'll be convening with Eskim, with the Chambers, with NAFCOC. Uh, we have a close working relationship with a very strong team from the Richards Bay um, IDZ who are driving the gas gasification side of things, um, and they're fully equipped with engineers and the, the HR resources that we might not have. And from the third week of January, it's all systems go. Um, because I've been through a supply chain process of advertising and Anybody from across the country has been is, has been able to to tender. We now have a legitimate supply chain process. We're at liberty to proceed with the the the, the people who have submitted. We're putting them into a basket into one team. Um, some of them are international. Some are very local. Some of them are want to set up small solar farms in tribal communities, which is a great initiative if if the numbers work. Um, so it's a pretty diverse and really. Uh, potentially transformative approach that will, would package these guys into one directed battery pack per job job sustaining node, as it were. And that's it. And Eskimo, the, the people I've spoken to Eskimo said, please, if you, can, if you can ease the burden, we've run out of money. We can't raise any more generation funding. We are, our, we are generated to the, to the max. Whatever we can do to raise money to to generate more energy, please find ways to do it. And this way, you sort of bypass a lot of the red tape, a lot of the impediments that might otherwise have stopped this process. But for us, 
load shedding for our job creating business is the core of our economy that is most at risk of ripping the guts out of our society and and as the agency that's our sniper rifle focus for the next year amongst other things but yeah. it's extraordinary again as i say it, it seems so obvious because if you've got a house that is uh, suffering from eskim load shedding the first thing you do if you can afford it is go and get a battery get an inverter get something in there that can ensure that you you still have power when eskim is off so why not for businesses and i suppose a question would have been you got to buy a really big battery and uh how expensive are they and how efficient are they yeah that's a that's a that's a key point alec and th- those numbers are still to be through the wash but if you consider that eskom is planning double digit increases for the next 5 years that's a 50% increase in the, over the next short term the we believe that the the renewables that are coming in and certainly the gas that's coming in is going to be significantly significantly cheaper that will afford us the the spare change uh with which we can use to procure um the the energy storage the battery packs and i think that it, even if the even if the businesses are paying the same and we are transparent in our costing to say that the savings you would have made is going towards the battery pack they would be willing for the sake of continuity of energy supply why hasn't something like this happened years ago <laughs> there's two parts to your question why haven't the rpps been in two years uh, many years ago and i think that's that's a that's a painful question not to be able to answer it should have been answered the rpp process has been delayed unnecessarily and i'm told that if it had been done when it should have been done the 4 mega gigawatts that we short uh would be in the system by now so there's been a, a national delay in in this process but in terms of the specifics of what we've come up with now i just don't think i don't think local people have pushed hard enough for answers and we're just not stopping we you know luckily where i am uh, with economic recovery i can go to businesses and i can go to governments and i can say it's not business as usual this economy is about to cl- collapse if you're going to equate law x y z at me i'm going to look at you with blazed eyes because i'm going to go back to your constituents who are hungry and are ready to loot again and i'm going to tell them that law 123 says we can't plug this in here that's madness <laughs> you know and i don't buy it so either the economy wins or law 123 of some forgotten act wins and yeah we got to force our way through these things and work within the law as much as we can but find ways through it james i i i had a conversation with uh, jordan hill lewis uh, of uh, the mayor of cape town probably just over a year ago and he said there was a, a slight opening of the door uh, in enabling cape town to start procuring its own uh, electricity and he said he just kicked the door open because a lot of the laws that were stopping or preventing him from doing it were stupid laws uh, archaic laws from from your perspective when you're talking about hungry people who have rioted just uh, just over a year ago I, i i guess it'll be very difficult for any sane or, or rational person to to argue some kind of a law against that but have you had any pushback well you see that's where the problem comes in you probably find in the western cape the credit rating is not as bad as some of our municipalities i won't go into details some of our municipalities are have such an abominable uh, credit record that eskim will not entertain the discussion i'm having with you because i'm interfering in a um in 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 the affairs of a business that owes a lot of money and it would potentially compromise eskim's ability to collect whatever revenue is outstanding so that is a complication for which we have to be very wary and in our case one or two of our municipalities do have that problem that means that we have to go the route that i'm saying which is stay internal don't interfere with the overall power supply if our municipalities were in good standing i could quite easily wheel from moy river or newcastle for that matter or cape town i could wheel into um, peter maritzburg and supply hulum in, in peter maritzburg but because of the issue of credit ratings of our municipalities there there's a complexity that uh, the western cape may not have had so for now we're taking the can i call it the bikini version 
it's not the grand scale, but at least it's going to stabilize energy supply to our job holding businesses. Mgeni is uh, with Christopher Pappas as the mayor there. Are they back in good standing with Eskom? I believe they are. Yeah. So does that make it easier to to deal on their behalf than say uh, Peter Maritzburg, which isn't in good standing? It would. It does make it easier. Eskom are far more obliging under those circumstances to look at those sort of situations. Yeah. And what about hydro? Uh, I spoke earlier, in fact, today to Christopher Pappas, and he he uh, listed Albert Falls, Howick Falls, Midmar Dam, Carcliffe Falls. It it just appears as though there's a lot of potential, particularly in, in just, just using his municipality as an opportunity. And yet our Minister of Minerals is continuously quoting Grand Inga uh, in the DRC, which doesn't ever seem to be getting off the ground. I think I heard about that first 20 years ago, and there's still no power coming out of it. Yeah. Hydro, one of our RPPs made that very submission. Um, for exactly this, the, the schemes that you've been talking about. So we now have an opportunity to engage with them on those, on those potentials, how it falls. A, there is a defunct hydro plant there. Spring Grove Dam, for example, is, it releases huge amounts of water. Um, and then the drop between Midmar Dam and, and the other dam, Albert Falls, is probably three 400 meters. So those opportunities are what we're going to be focusing on to a large extent now going forward. So Chris is right. Um, he, he can do it on his side or we can collaborate. Obviously, as the district municipality, we, we won't interfere. We will facilitate the process, but we're not in the value chain. So if it is hydro within Amgeni, we will link them up with Chris and his team. Our job is to facilitate that process. So at least this way around, we can look at it from a district perspective. And we've been through a um, supply chain process that will enable us to start basically in January, Feb. So bottom line it for us, James, if I have a business in the Midlands of KZN, anywhere from Peter Maritzburg to uh, all the way down to Moy River, I will be able to get uninterrupted power in a year's time. Yeah. <laughs> You've just put a rope around my neck and I'm... <laughs> That's what we're aiming for, Alec. It may be optimistic for each and every business because I think we are going to have to group industrial parks together and large-scale businesses together. Um, it may or may not be feasible for a corner cafe to have its own battery pack and to plug into this system. I'm, you know, I think we've got to be careful. But certainly, we do work closely with all the local municipalities and we will be reviewing their job nodes to see how we can plug in uh, how we can link our RPPs into the job-centric nodes within the district. And if you were in the industrial park next to Midmar Dam, for example, I would say your chances of that are very good. Yeah. And your role is to facilitate all of this. You're not going to pay for it. You're not going to make profit out of it. Yeah. We, are, are, we facilitate hundreds of millions, millions of rands worth of work. As government, that's our job. We unlock this, we unlock that, we get investors in, facilitate transactions. Our job is to get the wheels turning, to get the EIAs through. Just recently at Camperdown, we had 400 hectares of land that um, was locked into agriculture. It took us 24 months to get it unlocked. We had to go to Pretoria and back a couple of times, but um, essentially through the, our intervention in the what we call red tape reduction, we managed to free up the 400 hectares. So that our job is to just keep these wheels turning and, and unlock wherever the bottlenecks might be. And I can just hear some of our community members saying, oh, yeah, it's government. They always talk big. They don't deliver. How do you respond to that? They're right. And I'm not to defend it. I would let them, just let them see us in 12 months' time. The farmers of the district know I've been talking to them for five years and I've been promising this and that. And over time, the work that we've done is, has borne fruit. And I think these things take their own time. But in this case, I think we have a track record behind us that does speak for itself. Luckily, we're not in the thick of the corridors of government as the agency. We have one foot in the private sector, one foot um, in, in government. And maybe just to, to speak to that very point, the president uh, launched an initiative called Social Compacts. And in this district, we are by far ahead of everyone else in South Africa. It's a what we call a platform of accountability. It's where 
local government sits around the table with public with private sector melanie nafcock uh, we sit with civil society and organized labor <clears throat> and we've now signed an agreement a service level agreement and it's called the platform of accountability where in italian we say the tongue goes to the sore tooth where the tongue will be at meeting after meeting and there will be levels of accountability it's not a talk shop um, it's a place where the discussions that i'm having with you will hold us to account to say you promised one two three four now what have you done about it so we really are trying to break that trust deficit that is that is formed between ourselves as government and the private sector and they're completely justified um i work you know with farmers and community across the district and and they roll their eyes when you bring new initiatives but i really do think we we're pushing and if i was to go through some of the projects that we've been involved with over the last 18 months i think you would see that there's a little tired a, a tiny tsunami making its way up the n3 corridor and we're driving it <laughs> james martin uh you are a purveyor of hope uh at a time when south africa desperately needs it and we look forward to monitoring the progress in the uh, provision of power to uh, businesses in the KZN Midlands. I'm Alec Hogg from biznews.com.